Larry Smith, open is yours. It's good to be here again, and I forgot how the population of the auditorium cuts in half when the kids leave. <laughs> that's a really good thing. That's really good. I can tell you that I've been to a lot of churches where there are no children at all, and that I feel bad for those churches. So it's good to see that you all have children, love children, and do something special for them. A youth center, that's a great thing too. So thank you all for caring so much about the kids. It's so important. And some people say it's the next generation of believers. I think it's the present and the next generation of believers. So I thank God for them. Uh, well, I do have, I guess, a few things I just should mention. We are uh, New England Bible College Seminary. I'm, I'm still there. Uh, I was president, I'm vice president now of uh, helping students get involved in the ministries and that sort of thing. And unfortunately, I don't have anybody I can send out here uh, to candidate to be a pastor right now. Uh, all the people we have are either pastors or they're already uh, involved somewhere uh, heavily. So, But we are praying for you. Just let that be known. I have some of these pamphlets in the back and there's also one that looks kind of like this that says, Fast Facts, it tells things about the school, if you want to know some quick things about the school. Since we've gone online over the past few years since COVID, we've, our numbers over this fall finally took a major jump up, which is wonderful. And in fact, uh, over 60% increase, but many of these students are doing it online. So we have some fully online classes if you're interested in undergrad studies in Bible theology ministry, even some general studies, you can go to our website and go completely online and just watch videos like, like the creation video. And then do some reading and do some writing and, and respond to the professor. We also have uh, all of our other classes are also streamed online live. So for example, if a class meets on a Wednesday morning, then if, you, if you're available on Wednesday morning, you could take that class just by getting on your computer or your smartphone. We'll just email you a link and click on it to take the class. Also, students um, who are in grade 7, 8, no, I'm sorry, grade 8, 9, 10, 11, no, 9, 10, 11, 12. Why am I forgetting that? 9, 10, 11, 12, I guess because when I grew up in New Brunswick, Canada, high school was 10, 11, and 12. Middle school was 6, 7, and 8. And so after all these years of living in Maine, I still get that mixed up sometimes. So, but anyone in high school, I should have just said, can take classes, and they can take them for free. Everyone else has to pay $300 a course. If you go anywhere else in America, Canada, you're paying at least $1,200 a course. So we're very, very inexpensive. And we have great professors, though. We have uh, professors who have degrees everywhere from Moody Bible Institute to Dallas Seminary to... Uh, Harvard University and so forth. So we have some great people that all love the Lord dearly. And this summer we're doing an event you may be interested in. It's designed for pastors and church leaders, but I think anyone can attend. We're actually co-sponsoring it with uh, another organization out of the Bangor area, but they're going to do it in a Jess Catering and Brewer, and they're also going to go to a place in Portland. I forgot the name of it now. But this is Jan uh, July... 29th and 30th, but you can go on our website and find us. And Erwin Lutzer and Frank Turret, who's a famous apologist now, pretty famous now, and another gentleman, Abdu something, who was a Muslim, I forgot his last name. Abdu Murray. Murray, that's it, thank you. Who uh, was a Muslim who converted to Christianity. And by the way, over 10 million Muslims have in the last 20 years. Yeah. So God is doing amazing work. All you hear sometimes on what is affectionately now called legacy media, the typical media, uh, all you hear now is occasionally you have a, a Christian go over to Islam or American soldier stay in one of those countries and become uh, one of the, <coughs> the rebels, I suppose, the terrorist organizations, whatever. But the reality, and you hear about Palestine, you know, the pro-Palestine pro protesting all the time. What you don't hear about the, is the 10 million Muslims who came to Christ. And you don't hear about 200,000 people who came to Christ last year just by Billy Graham Evangelistic Association websites alone. Just that alone is 200,000 people. 
And the first country for the numbers of people coming to the Lord was, was the United States. So God is doing a work, and sometimes we don't realize it. Rock Church in Bangor, at, at Easter Sunday, between three campuses, having three services, only 18 years old, three campuses, three services, had uh, 2,700 people. So even in Bangor, people are starting to go to church. They're finding Jesus. They had 160 people uh, came to Christ last year from that church alone. But there are other you know, large churches that preach the gospel in our area. And uh, that's just one example. So God is doing some great things, both at school and, and both at churches that we're partnering with. So just so you'll know, you'll, you'll be hearing uh, that we sold our campus in Bangor. And the reason we did it is because a neighboring business offered us a large amount of money we couldn't refuse because we, we needed money. And we have a place in Portland and we have a place in Augusta. And so we might be centralizing in Augusta, but the Rock Church and Cross Point, which used to be Bangor Baptist, and now I understand even Calvary Baptist and Brewer, they've all opened up their churches to us to have classes there for in-person classes. But 70% of our students are attending pretty much completely on their phone or their computer. Why? Because when you hit January and February, you don't have to cancel a class. It's a wonderful thing. You don't have to go out when it's dark at 4 p.m., right? So it's a great thing, and a lot of people love it from young to old. Even some of the older students who never thought they'd be able to adapt uh, have adapted. So, so there, there's the quick look one there. And um, this is for, um, I guess I didn't have any of those up. I didn't put any of those up, but this is for church partners uh, who would partner with us. So, Erwin Lutzer is an amazing pastor, a preacher, teacher. He uh, was at Moody Memorial Church in Chicago for many years, so you, you would enjoy him a great deal, especially. Then I also have all these pamphlets, which some of you remember, out there on the banister as you go down the stairs. So don't hesitate to take them. They're all free. And uh, happy to provide those things from years of study of Scripture and teaching and trying to condense things down to a simple five or ten minute read, because that's attention span of most people today, even less than that. On radios, they say the attention span is about 30 seconds. That's why they constantly hit you with things. You know, even a radio program, even the Christian radio programs, you only listen for 10 minutes and then boom, they give you their own commercial. Or they give you some other commercials, then they come back in again. Because our, we're just so wired that way now. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So we're in the uns and shuns, that means it must have been written by Paul. That's true. All the uns and shuns, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, all written by Paul. And so you have the history books at the beginning, five history books, uh, Gospels, and the book of Acts. Then you have Paul's letters. Then you have Hebrews, who we don't know for sure who wrote it. Could have been Paul, could have been Luke, could have been Paulus, could have been Peter. But we go from there to the books who are written by the names on the books. So after Hebrews, every name, like John and Jude and James, are all written by those individuals. So we're in 1 Thessalonians, which is near the middle of your New Testament. And we're in chapter 5. And I just want to look at three simple verses, and then we'll pray. So look at verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Be joyful always. Pray continually, which could also mean always. Some translations say pray without ceasing. It can also be translated incessantly, which would be more of a negative slant on that. But pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances. And then catch this last phrase. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's will. This is only stated a couple times in the New Testament. And the other time is in Ephesians 5, where it says, when it's talking about not being drunk with wine, but being filled with the Spirit. And then it says, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And it goes on to talk about godliness, Christian character. So in this same place, he's talking about this same kind of thing. And he talks about... All around this passage, he's talking about Christian character. So let's focus on these three statements. Because this is God's will. Be joyful. <clears throat> or rejoice. I I'll, I'll like to use the word rejoice, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Pray constantly, continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you so much for your word and how important it is to us. You preserved it over the centuries for us. And even when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, back in um, 1947, the shepherd was looking around for a lost sheep. And he threw rocks in the caves and that it was hard to get into, uh, like especially ones going down. And he'd have to have a rope to get into. So he just thought he'd throw rocks and see if the sheep would make a noise. And he heard a ting noise, and he said, I've got to go investigate what's in there. And he found those Dead Sea Scrolls. And those Dead Sea Scrolls were copies of the Old Testament that were identical to other copies. And the latest copies we had were a thousand, a thousand years old. That's it. They only went back to 1000 AD. And these Dead Sea Scrolls went back to pre-Christ, just before, as early as 100 B.C., so they were up to 1,100 years older than what we had, and they were almost identical to what we had. So it proved that you had preserved your word for us. Because the skeptics said, there's no way that it can be transmitted orally, or even in writing, by hand. People are going to make enough mistakes that over time it's not going to be any good. But that's not true. Your word has been preserved extremely well. And when you look at the New Testament, Scholars say it's 99.9% .9 textually pure. In other words, it is exactly what was written 2,000 years ago. So thank you, Father. We, we didn't have the internet to back things up on. We didn't have printing presses until I think it was 1354 or somewhere around there. That we had, the printing press was developed and one of the first books was a Bible. And many Bibles were printed off that press. But before that, it was all done by hand. And so skeptics just said they don't trust the New Testament either. So thank you, Father, for verifying these things for us, that we can look at your word and know that it's reliable, it's trustworthy. Archaeologists, historians, astronomers, biologists, when they look honestly at what the Bible said thousands of years ago about what we know today, they say, yes, it's absolutely correct. So thank you, Father, that your word stands out far and above every other so-called religious book, or religious book, which is so-called true. Your word is true, and the others are not. It's very simple to see if someone does a little bit of investigating. Thank you, Father, for protecting your word. And so now we come to your word, and you have told us through Paul, through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, that we are to rejoice and to pray and to give thanks because this is your will. So Father, please teach us about that. It's very, very important that we learn to do your will. So thank you, Father. I ask for your blessing on this and you would tug on our hearts until we act. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. So I, if I were to put a title on this, I would uh, call it Fire Your RPG. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But first, I want to start with this uh, object lesson. I've got these three ropes here, a uh, red one, a blue one, and a white one. And this hopefully will help stimulate our memory as we look at this. Let's think of rejoicing as the red one, because it's represented heat. So let's get warm and hot for Jesus. Uh, Revelation 3 talks about laying to see in church. And Jesus is speaking to the church, and he doesn't like the fact that they're not doing anything. He says, you're luxurious, but you're lazy. I've given you all these resources, and you're lazy. But you're lukewarm, so I'm about to spit you out. So he, doesn't, he wants us to be hot. So let's be hot with joy. Let's rejoice in the Lord. And then the blue one can represent prayer, and the white one can represent giving thanks. Because these are things that God wants us to all do. So I'm going to take and untie these three ropes, and... Um, <clears throat> Then I'm going to <clears throat> show you something about that. Um, so let me see, I've got those ropes untied. Uh, let's get these ropes untied here. And now I'm going to get a little bit of magic dust here to put on my rope. There we go. So that I can put all three ropes together. And that would be a tie. So, it's God's will for us to rejoice and to pray and to give thanks. Now, in this passage, the RPG comes from rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks. RPG. 
But if you were to go into the military, you'd soon discover that an RPG is a grenade. It's a rocket-propelled grenade, weighs three or four pounds, so it's a big one, and it will, you can shoot it up to the length of, uh, very accurately, to the length of about three soccer fields, end on end, the long way. And if it hits a tank, it can pierce up to 13 inches of steel. So it can literally stop a tank if you hit it in the right place. A whole big tank can be stopped with this one weapon that weighs about 17 pounds, and you've got that three or four pound grenade. And you can have a couple other grenades on you, or depending how strong you are, how much you can carry. So you can have that, it's only about this long, and um, some of them are designed with tripods, some are designed to just carry and hold, and you've probably seen them on TV anyway. But they, they, and they travel in just a few seconds. But the damage they can do is incredible. Well, God wants us to rejoice, pray, and give thanks for our benefit and also to do damage to the enemy. Satan and demons are constantly trying to get us to think about everything that's wrong in our lives so that we don't rejoice. Trying to think us that, trying to get us to think like the world, which is very secular, so that we don't pray. And trying to just be overly unhappy and we don't have enough, so that we don't give thanks. Notice it said give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. We need to be giving thanks. Brother Lawrence uh, said that, uh, pr he called this practicing the presence when you make yourself aware constantly of God by rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, and giving thanks in all circumstances. But specifically talking about prayer, he said there's an awareness uh, of presence, of God's presence, anywhere, anytime. He said, I have abandoned all particular forms of devoted, uh, devotion, sorry, all prayer techniques. My only prayer practice is attention. I carry on a habitual, silent, and <clears throat> secret conversation with God that fills me with overwhelming joy. A constant, <clears throat> habitual, <clears throat> silent, secret conversation. And that's what practicing the presence is. So, like, for example, when I'm walking, I'm, if I've got something to think about, talk about, I just say, hey, Lord, what about, and just start talking to him. Just like I would if, if you and I were alone driving a car somewhere, we'd be talking. That's what I do with the Lord. I've learned to practice the presence. And what a difference it's made in my life. It's so much easier to rejoice because immediately I can take my burdens to the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on him. So if you think of casting, that's what you do, like throwing a baseball or casting a fishing rod. The only difference is that in this case, you're not supposed to reel it back. But as human beings, that's what we do. Our, our sense of trusting God is fishing. No, I'm not going to give up. Here you go, God. I can't take this anymore. Oh, but Lord, what about... I can't take it anymore. Yes, Lord, I want this. I want this. We're not supposed to do the reeling back. We're supposed to trust in God. Trust in His sovereignty. Therefore, it should be easy to rejoice knowing that He's taking care of these things. Knowing that even our trials are for our benefit. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance will finish its work, so that you will be mature and complete and not lacking anything. So anytime we suffer difficulties, it is for our benefit. And we forget that. It's so easy to think about the pain in the moment, whether it's physical or emotional, even spiritual, and to forget. Now remember, this word is a verb. Rejoice. It's a command. We are supposed to do it, whether we want to or not. And I was thinking about, you know, how some people, they say, like, fake it till you make it. Well, there's some truth in that. If, if, it, if at first, if you haven't rejoiced in a long time, or you find it hard to take joy in the Lord, then just start doing it. Fake it at first. Experience it. It's like if you can't wakeboard behind a boat, but you've never tried it, you can't honestly say you can't do it because you haven't tried it. So don't say you can't rejoice if you don't do it. So it's a doing <coughs> word. It's a verb. And it also is an always thing. The next word is pan. And, uh, you know, you, you've heard of pantheism. That's where God is in everything. That's the belief in that view. 
Well, all is pan in Greek. You know a lot of Greek already. You just don't know it, maybe, if you haven't studied Greek. But pan is one word that you know already. And um, <clears throat> there are other words, too. For example, the next word for prayer is proxukamai. And that's the same base for the word proximity. Proximity, you can almost say. Proximity. And that means to be in the presence. And that's the word for prayer. Get yourself close to God, within proximity of God. <clears throat> I brought with me this morning this little harmonica. <clears throat> I bought this in a Cracker Jack box. Or I bought the Cracker Jack box. When I was a kid, you got a big, for five cents, a big box with caramel colored, uh, car car caramel covered popcorn peanuts. And they always came with prizes. And so this is one that I, I don't know, I, I just found it one day at my dad's place. I'm like, oh, that, I remember that. So I grabbed and kept it um, all this time. And it says made in West Germany, so that's proof on it that it's old. And it's got a piece broken out of it. So this is a little toy, and I think sometimes of, of myself. This is like me, I'm, I'm cracked, I'm not perfect. Um, I don't look all that great, I probably don't sound all that great, but God can do something special with it. <clears throat> That little song is Sweet Hour of Prayer. Some of you recognize it. So it's a sweet, for me, it's not just an hour, though. Just like Brother Lauren said, it's, it's this constant thing. And it's just changed, revolutionized my life when I learned about practicing the presence of God. And prayer is a very big part of that. A taxi driver and a pastor both passed away at the same time and went to heaven. And they met Peter at the gate at the same time. And Peter said, come on in, gentlemen. I want to show you around and, and where you're going to be living. So he takes the taxi driver, and, and the pastor's kind of tagging along, up to this big mansion on top of the hill. He said, that house right there, taxi driver, is yours. And so then he takes the pastor, he says, follow me, I'll show you your house. So he goes down this hill, down to where all these little houses are, and the pastor gets a shack at the end of the street. And the pastor was thinking the whole time, you know, if the taxi driver gets this mansion, I should get something really, really good. So he says to Peter, I preached and I taught, and I visited, and I counseled, and I did funerals and weddings. Why have I got such a tiny little shack? And the taxi driver gets this mansion. Well, Peter said, well, I'll tell you something. When the taxi driver drove in New York City, people prayed. And when you preached, people fell asleep. <laughs> so it doesn't matter who you are. You could be great or small in the kingdom. But what will make a difference is how well the Lord knows you and how well you know the Lord. If you remember in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, he said that many will come to me and say, I cast out demons, I perform miracles. But he might say, or he will say to many of them, depart from me. I never knew you. There's no relationship there. So that's extremely important. Then he goes on to say, those who will be there, those who... Do the will of my Father. Very, very important. Then if you go to 1 John chapter 2, you discover the people who are definitely believers. The Bible says very clearly who believers are. What is more tricky for us to decide sometimes who a believer, who is not a believer. That's harder. But who is a believer? The Bible is very clear, 1 John chapter 2. They love God, they love their neighbor, and they obey God. Very important. But Jesus added that to the whole salvation experience. He adds knowing him. 
if you look, if you say, look, one day I prayed a prayer as a child, and that's all you've ever done, and you don't pray, you don't read your Bible, you may not be saved. There's a very, very good chance the odds are against you of being saved. Don't trust just because you prayed a little prayer. You have to walk with Christ. Revelation is full of statements like, he who overcomes. Read Revelation. I know some people are scared to read Revelation because it's the prophecies with the seals and the bowls and the punishment. But there's so much more there than that. There's this whole piece of, of relationship with Jesus. The first three chapters are Jesus talking to the churches, seven types of churches. Some people talk about them being different, different periods of history. I don't really think that's right. I think it's seven different churches that exist right now. I think in America, yeah, Laodicean is probably a pretty, pretty big one because we have everything. We're the richest people in the world in America. We have everything we could possibly need. Most of us have two cars, and the rest of the world, they can't afford one car. The average family doesn't have a car. If you want to go by averages, there is no car in most families in the world. But we all have at least two, and then we have motorcycles and boats, and, you know, we have garages we can't even get our cars into. That's America, right? But... The other churches, anyway, talks about them. I was going to chase that rabbit. I'm not going to do that. But as you go on, in Revelation 4 and 5, you read about the Lamb of God. And around the throne of heaven, they're, they're saying, who is worthy to unroll the scroll? We have to unroll the scroll. But there's no one who's worthy. And then in walks Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And he unrolls the scroll. He sits at the right hand of God. What a beautiful picture of heaven. And then... Uh, at the last two chapters, you have the prophecy stuff there. Then you go to the last two chapters, and it's all about the new Jerusalem coming down of heaven, out of heaven to the new earth, which is where we will live in eternity with Christ. I, I, I tell you, those last two chapters of the Bible are amazing, and I read them from time to time just for encouragement. But, but do that. Read those chapters. Very important to have. It's very important to be an overcomer and to have that relationship with the Lord. Philippians 2 said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, you might think, well, you don't, you can't believe in eternal security. Yes, I do. But did someone truly make a decision when they were younger? If you're one of those people who, who you don't know, then you need to know, and you can know. Simply by ABC, admitting your sin in your life, believing in Jesus dying on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin, and then confessing that Jesus is Lord. That's the part a lot of preachers don't uh, remember to talk about. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, We must believe in our heart that God is with the confess with our mouths that He is Lord. That's a big part of it. We have to acknowledge who He really is. It's not, it's not enough to say, God's Son came and died for me. Who is God's Son? Who is Jesus? We need to understand who Jesus is. That what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Because other religions, with that and grace, God, by His grace, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die, who is one with Him. So, in fact, He dies for us because He loves us so much. And no other religion teaches grace. Every other religion is about works. That's why Jesus said, some will come to me and say, I worked, I worked, I worked. He'll say, get out. And that pastor say, I worked, I worked, I worked. Tiny, tiny little house, your shack. So, uh, keep in mind that, yes, we are to show our faith by our works according to James. But we have to have faith. We have to have a complete trust, which is a relationship, as Jesus said. Those who might know will be the ones who go into heaven. Now, God obviously knows everyone, but this is the relationship part. He doesn't have a relationship with everyone because James 4, 8 says, come near to God or draw near to God and He will come near to you. So, even though He does the calling for salvation, you know, he, the Holy Spirit convicts us and calls us, then we must respond. We must respond. That's, scripture is full of so many statements of what we must do to have this relationship with the Lord. And most of this is summed up here in rejoicing, <coughs> praying, and giving thanks. So this, remember, this word prayer here is proxukamai, which has to do with proximity. Uh, Albert Einstein was asked one time uh, by a doctoral student, and here's what you need to know about doctoral students is if you take a master's degree, then you become a master of a subject. But it's a general subject, like preaching or uh, theology or a specific part of theology. When you do doctoral work, not only do you go in a specific part of, say, theology, um, let's say eschatology, 
which is the, the study of last things. When we think about Revelation, we think about last things, or Daniel. So when you study that, you have many, many specific areas you can go to. You can talk about the four millennial views, like the millennium of, in the Bible, a thousand year period. There's four views on that by Christians, by evangelical, even conservative evangelical Christians who believe they're differently from each other. Of four views of that. And then there's four views of how to interpret Revelation, predominantly, among the same people. So, uh, and then you have, you know, liberals and others who have other views. So, uh, with that in mind, um, I forgot where it's going. Oh, yes. So, Einstein, doctor student, came to him and said, I don't know what to study. I don't know what is left to study. And Einstein said, prayer. Somebody must study prayer. Now, Albert Einstein's been called an atheist by atheists, but the reality is he said there was a God, and he said someone should study prayer. So he couldn't have been the atheist of today. So also it says, incessantly, without ceasing, constantly, unceasingly. That's the word of how we should pray. Just constantly be in prayer. And then finally, it says to give thanks. To give thanks. That's the G. Be thankful. Again, another verb. And this is the word Eucharisto, which if you if it sounds familiar at all, is the word Eucharist. And so a lot of traditional uh, traditions within Christianity, like Anglicanism, Catholicism, they use the word Eucharist to describe what we would call typically the Lord's Supper or Communion. Because it has the word, that is the word in the, in the Greek. And it has grace in there. So because of God's grace, we have everything to be thankful for. And so this is a compound word. Charis is just one part of the word. But you put it all together, and it means to give thanks because of what he's done. God has done so much. And one of the parts of the compound word is to do it well. So we are to be very thankful. And we are to do this all the time. And David Jeremiah at one time said, an attitude of gratitude sets the altitude. So an attitude of gratitude will set the proper altitude. So we need to learn to be thankful. When I started practicing thankfulness, it changed a lot for me. It was easier to be joyful when I was thankful. These all work together. It's easy to pray. Well, if you're going to thank, be thankful to God specifically, then you're going to pray because you're talking to Him. So we got to pray to be thankful. And if we're thankful, we're going to rejoice. So they all work together to, to build up your faith uh, with Christ. Baseball legend Yogi Berra was taunting Hank Aaron at the plate during the regular season game, trying to distract him, and he teased, you know that the label should be facing up when you swing your bat. You'll probably hit better. So Hank Aaron didn't even look at his bat, totally ignored him, hit the ball way out in left field for a home run in the bleachers, and he just walks around, comes back, and said, I didn't come here to read. <laughs> Came here to play. Right? And uh, God wants us to have an attitude like that. We came here to play. So we, we just read about rejoicing and praying and giving thanks because it's God's will, but now we need to play. Now we need to rejoice. We need to pray and we need to give thanks. And... We can do it. I know I told you the, one of the last times I was here, my daughter had brain cancer. And she's doing exceptionally well now. It's answers to prayer. Just praise God for that. It's not normal to do so well right now. So that's obviously an answer to prayer to us. We're so thankful. But the day that she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, she's 35, 34 now. The same day she was diagnosed with a brain tumor, my mother passed away. And I couldn't go see my mother because she was in a hospital in Canada and they only allowed you, uh, you had to go in quarantine for two weeks and it was impossible for me to just do that. So she said, I'll, I'll probably be fine when I first talked to her, but she passed away, right, when she was in the hospital. So uh, that was a tough time, but I still rejoiced because it said to do it. And God gave me peace. He said, just trust me. And I just knew that I could trust him. Same with my daughter. She's been incredible. She just totally trusts God with this whole situation. She's been she goes to Boston every single month. She's had more MRIs than, I don't know if I can say it. No, I can count bigger than that. But she's had a lot of MRIs and CAT scans and just crazy, you know, on and on going. But 
She's doing extremely well. So we always have something to rejoice for, be thankful for, right? So even if you can't just rejoice in the, your present situation, maybe you can think about things that God's done for you. I recommend keeping a prayer journal, and especially the answers to prayer. Write everything down that when you find out God answers a prayer for somebody. You can even write down today when you go home, start your journal and say, Dr. T, Terry Smith, <laughs> that's what they call me at school, uh, was here today and he was praising God for his daughter, you know, who has brain cancer and is doing exceptionally well. And there's no evidence of it right now. Mm -hmm. So that's an answer to prayer. And 200,000 people came to Christ last year through Billy Graham Evangelist Association alone. And then 10 million Muslims came to Christ in the last 20 years. You know, just so many answers to prayer all around us, but then it gets real personal too. The more you pray, the more you write it down, the more you see God answering prayer. So it's a wonderful practice to have. Practice the presence of God in your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you for so much, how much you love us. It's just incredible. And we're so undeserving of how much you love us. But you do. And we should be thankful if we're not. But I thank you, and I praise you, and I rejoice and uh, you're just so good. And so I want to I love this RPG up. I want to see damage done to the enemy. Cause, because the moment we start complaining or backbiting or gossiping or just whining, Satan is happy. Because bad, uh, not bad, but sour Christians do so much dam damage to the name of Jesus and to the church. And the whole process of evangelism makes it harder for everyone who's sincere about winning people to Christ. So hard. That's the number one thing I've heard over the years as well. I don't want to go there where those people are. I don't want to go to that church. And I remember pastoring a church where people would say that to me and say, okay, go to the next church then. I don't care if you go to my church. That kind of shocked them. But, Lord, I just pray you'd help us to realize how important it is to be joyful and to pray, and to be thankful. You want a relationship with, you just can't wait for us to spend more time praying, talking to you. But instead, we pull out our phones and we look at someone else, some, something that someone else says, and, and half the time, the things that we read on the phone are not true. We're supposed to think on things that are true, and pure, and praiseworthy. So we should spend more time in your word to get that. Help us, Father, to be more like you, to be more like Jesus. And if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, I pray that they would come to know you and talk to one of the leaders or myself. Um, but it's as simple as ABC, and they believe and confess so they can do it right now in just a second and truly be in Christ. And then help us, Lord, those of us who are believers, and, and those as well, to just rejoice and pray and give thanks. It's your will. It's your will. Thank you, Father, for revealing it so clearly to us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You do the song? Okay. We'll close with that, okay? Okay. That's what I do. Sorry, James. <laughs> I'd like to uh, close with one of my favorite hymns. I've added a chorus to it, which is more personal, talking to the Lord. But uh, it's called What a Friend. And I remember singing this one time in Chicago. I was at a mission. When I was at Moody, it was my Christian ministry to go to a mission in the south side of Chicago. And one of the guys would always request, what a friend. And he was had a rough life. And one time when I was speaking or singing, um, a guy came in and he had a knife still in him. Walked into the back and kind of collapsed in the back pew. And a couple of the workers went to him. And then a couple of police came in. And... Just, it's crazy what it can be like in a city and the things you see, even in a mission like that. But they would come in, if they would listen to the gospel, and a song or two, or sing a song or whatever, then they could have a free meal and stay the night. That was, that was the charge. It's just to listen for a half hour or so. But what a friend. Um, even, even someone who's down and out can have a friend in Jesus. <clears throat> what a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear
anywhere, just waiting for you. All right. Thank you, Terry. You're almost missed.